The following sermon is from City Life Church. For more information about City Life Church, please visit us at clcgreenwood.com. Good morning, City Life. How you doing? Uh, if you don't know, my name is Jordan McLean. I'm the youth pastor here. And Mike wanted me to get up here this morning um, to read the scripture before he came up here and prayed, or before he came up here to preach. Um, but before I do that, there's a couple of things. If you missed last week, we showed a video um, which announced something really exciting for this coming 2020. If, first of all, the fact that it's 2020 next year is insane because a month away is actually insane to me. But if you missed that video, go check it out on Facebook because we announced um, the, 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 the focus of 2020, which is going to be us um, coming alongside every one of you and helping disciple you and equipping you and walking with you for this next year. So we're really excited about that because we know we have a lot of new believers um, in our church this year. And, and we are super pumped up about this, this idea of helping equip you and walking next alongside of you. So if you missed that video, go please check that out. Um, and before I read this, one other thing. I'm excited about this one. Um, a little celebration. Celebration of what God did this week. Um, this is like one of my favorite. Yeah, woohoo. Um, no, but really. Um, so I'm, I'm the, the youth pastor here. So every Wednesday night we meet, our, our middle school and high school group meets um, at 630. So if you have a kid who hasn't been coming, send them our way. Um, but there's this, woo, again, yeah, and I have this, this student that has been in my class um, twice now. I had her as a sophomore um, in geometry, and now I have her in stats class as well. And her story, and if you, if you didn't know it was coming, she got saved on Wednesday. Well, so give, give God a celebration. But her story is so cool because her story is, is a story of God relentlessly pursuing her. She grew up in the church, um, which, was, which was cool because a lot of people in the church, um, they just expect that they should become Christians. But the cool thing about her mother is that as she taught her the gospel and taught her about Christ, she didn't expect her to be a Christian. She, kept, she always told her, it, this is about you and God, that relationship. It's got to be real. And so this girl knew this whole time that she wasn't a Christian. And um, the, the way God pulled her, is, the cool thing is she wasn't in my class this year. And she transferred in. So God put her in my class. God also put her in, with, in my class with one of her best friends. I invited her best friend to come to youth group. She brought that girl with her, and about a month ago, she came to me and said, I think I want to get baptized. I was like, it completely took me off. I was like, what? What are you talking about? She was like, I was like, Let, let's talk about, let's talk through this and, and see if you understand what this means, and the last month, I wasn't able to talk to her. I kept trying, but things kept coming up. I found out why. She came this last Wednesday, and she told me after the message, she was just bawling, and she was like, about a month ago, um, I was in like the darkest place I've ever been. And for some reason, just like this peace came over me, and God said, you can trust me. She was like, I realized at that point that I should trust God. And in this past month, I've been processing what this looks like. And, this, and tonight, everything you said was like exactly what God said to me a month ago. And she's like, I'm ready to surrender. I'm ready to put my full trust in God now. So can we just give a, a round of applause for God for what he's doing? Because, like, that is, that is the message of the gospel of God of God stepping in and, and taking control and saying, I'm coming for you, and I'm going to have you. So that, that is just a, a cool story. So let's, let's continue to praise God today. Um, if you'll turn your Bibles uh, to 1 Peter chapter 3, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this scripture what, from which Mike's going to be preaching from tonight, this morning, I guess. Uh, 1 Peter 3, 13 through 22 says, Who then will harm you if you are devoted to what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear or be intimidated, but in your hearts, regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that when you are accused, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison, 
who in the past were disobedient when God patiently waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. In it, a few, that is, eight people, were saved through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers subject to him. If you'll bow your heads with me, I'm going to open us up in some prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we do want to praise you this morning. Uh, we want to give you all the credit for everything that's going on. and Just for your faithfulness, Lord. Even while we were faithless, God, you, you were faithful to us and, and you relentlessly pursue us. God, I thank you just for the salvation of that girl. I thank you for this opportunity this morning to get into your word and to proclaim this, this gospel uh, to everyone sitting here this morning. I pray that your spirit would speak through Mike this morning, that you would empower him, that you would open the hearts of everyone in here to receive your message. And Lord, we ask for a miracle that you would enable someone to surrender their lives to you this morning. Lord, please be glorified. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. How's everybody doing? Good. Good to see you guys. So my name is Mike. I'm the lead pastor here. And you just met Jordan, who leads our student ministry. We have somebody who leads our middle school and somebody leading our city kids. So we have all you covered completely uh, when it comes to getting involved here at City Life. We also have a college ministry that meets some singles. We have everything for you, okay? And so we don't want you to be to know that you can plug in and be involved here at City Life, all right? Now, um, you've already heard about baptisms, okay? We cannot talk about this enough because this is something that we get to do with you to celebrate the life that God took you from and resurrected you out of and gave you a brand new life to now live in front of people. And so we throw a party when we baptize people. And what I mean by that is all of heaven rejoices when somebody gets saved. And so do we. That's why we celebrate. But then when we hear the person's story and we take them underwater and then we bring them out of the water, it is literally a celebration. We go crazy over that because that is the thing that is to be the most celebrated here on earth, we think, okay? And so if you've never been a part of our baptism service, we are excited for you to be on December 8th. And if you have any questions about whether you should get baptized or not, see one of our pastors or leaders, and we'll just kind of walk through that with you, okay? Uh, so we are continuing in 1 Peter 3, and what we're going to do is we're just going to kind of work through a little bit of what we heard today out of Scripture. So we're going to pull 13 back up, but let me ask you a question. Suppose we brought a person over from another country, and we asked them to, to go and study Christianity in America for about a month, okay? They know nothing about Christianity in America. We want them to go and partake in something and kind of report back to us. So we cut them loose. We tell them to go visit some churches, interview some Christians, and we want them to understand the culture of American Christianity, okay? Then we want them to remove themselves from American Christianity. We're going to hand them the Bible and say, now, Read the New Testament in a month also and spend some time here. Then we want to hear back from you. And we want to hear what your synopsis is on how the church in America lines up with the church that you read about in the New Testament. My guess is you're going to see a huge disparity between those two things. My guess is the number one thing that they would never see here in America is the suffering that they have seen or the explosion of new Christians or the explosion of growth that happened in the new churches, but then I'm going to come back around or the suffering. Because here in America, if we suffer in something, we rapidly change our circumstances so we no longer suffer, don't we? Now, let's say that we turn that same person loose in the underground church in China. Let's say that we turn that same person loose in southern India or northern India, where they are literally planting a thousand churches a week. Let me make sure you caught that statistic. Where they are literally planting a thousand churches a week, and as they leave, the declaration that they sign is they know that as soon as they leave this training center, they are literally taking their life in their own hands and placing it in God's because they know if they get caught, this is a death sentence for them. 
And I wonder what somebody would observe about that church in India, in the underground church in China, or where it's growing the fastest anywhere in the world in Iran and Pakistan right now. The one thing all of those churches have in common is suffering. They know what it's going to cost them to surrender their life to Jesus, to live this faith out in front of people, and the thing that is the highest cost to them is their life. Now, is there suffering in America for the gospel? There is. But it looks completely different. But God didn't put us in Iran, in India, in Africa, in the underground church in China. He put us here in America, which makes this scripture just as applicable to us as it does to them. Our suffering is just different. Now, the way that we view this as a church is what does that mean for us? Because the Bible says some really important things when it comes to suffering. For an example, Jesus said, for those of your, you who endure to the end, suffering with me will receive the crown of righteousness. There's an if in there, church. See, the thing that we want to do, though, is we want to kind of make our life so simple and compartmentalized, and we want to remove suffering at all costs. And the Bible does not give us that permission to do that. In fact, it says, if you are going to be a follower of Jesus, you are going to suffer, period. Right? But here's what's ironic about that. <clears throat> we as followers of Jesus, I think part of the observation in the overall arching thing of the Western church in the United States would be that honestly, we're just trying to live our best life now. Right? Right? We just want the best thing we can do and accomplish and build for ourselves here on this kingdom and this earth. I want you guys to think about and process this through your life right now. I mean, honestly, is there any suffering anywhere in your life for the sake of the gospel? I'm not saying we should look for it. I'm not saying we should seek it out. But what I'm telling you is, is you're a follower of Jesus in this world. You should be experiencing it at some level. This is what we're going to kind of work through today. So let's look back at verse 13. Here's what it says. There's a question posed. Who then will harm you if you are devoted to what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear or be intimidated. Let's stop for a second. Okay. Now, here's kind of a statement after this question. Even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. Now, all of us want to be blessed, right? All of us want God to look down on us and give favor to us. We just saw in the scripture before this that it says his eyes are on the righteous, his ears are open to their prayer, and that we, when we're insulted and even injured for the gospel, we should never give insult back. In fact, we should give a blessing back, okay? But then this comes down to us personally. Even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. Here's what that means. It's not a conjunction that if you will, it's when you suffer for righteousness, you will be blessed. Okay, now, here, what we're talking about in America and this whole entire series is this whole idea of citizenship. Okay, now, a person who does not know Jesus, their primary citizenship resides here in this world. Okay, this is where they build their portfolio. This is where they build their stock. This is where they build everything because this is their primary citizenship. When you surrender your life to Jesus, your citizenship is now transferred to a place that you don't live yet, okay? But what you're to do is to live out your citizenship here on earth where it belongs in heaven, okay? Which means I am now building things up for my life there, which is eternity compared to the really small temporary life I have here where my citizenship used to reside, right? Now, what I want you to start to think through our suffering is going to be mental and emotional here in America. Our suffering is going to be mental and emotional. Because what is going to happen is we are going to be ostracized at some level by society if we decide we're going to live Christianity out in front of people. Well, that's going to take a mental toll and it's going to take an emotional toll on you. When your own family members reject you, when your closest friends reject you, when your office workers or your co-workers want nothing to do with you any longer, that is going to induce a bit of emotional suffering inside of you. Look, we have to live where God placed us. 
Our, our, our suffering is not going to be risking our life for the gospel, more than likely here in America. But there is a degree that you have to embrace and understand what this looks like, okay? For an example, let's say I go to England, okay? And let's say that I go across the pond and I'm having a conversation with somebody and somebody finds out I'm a Yankee, okay? And somebody says, you are a sellout. You are no longer a citizen of this country. And I would say, no, 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 no. What you don't understand is like, this is where my family settled. We just came over to America because that's what my family and my ancestors did. No, no, no. I'm a citizen of England. No, you're not. You don't live here. You have no roots here. You have nothing holding you here. You're not a citizen of heaven. No, 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 no. No, listen, I am. That's why I'm here. I'm here to build a portfolio. I'm here to, to be ingrained in the culture. I'm a, I'm a citizen of, of England. Forget America. This is literally the same thing of how ridiculous and silly it would be for us to defend our citizenship here on earth when it no longer belongs here. But if you would go back and you would look at your calendar and you would look at your checkbook and you would look at what you do, which citizenship are you defending by those things? Because those are our markers. Which citizenship are you defending by the way that you embrace the suffering of a coworker who snubs you and wants nothing to do with you because of your gospel witness, right? So this is the way that we measure suffering today. It's the only way that we can. But just as ridiculous as it would be for me to go defend a citizenship where my family originated from is just as ridiculous as us putting everything that we have and own in this citizenship here on earth. Because we're no longer citizens here, right? So as we're walking through and understanding this, there's an interesting statement at the end of this. He says, even if you should suffer, when you suffer for righteousness, you will be blessed. Do not fear what they fear or be intimidated. Here's what they fear. They fear rejection. And so do we. If you're going to move through these lists of things that America is afraid of and everybody is fearful of, you know, spiders tops the list all the time. Public speaking is actually the number one fear in America, believe it or not, outside of dark places and all of those things. So just have mercy on me every week, okay? Public speaking, all right? But what else also tops this kind of social aspect is the fear of rejection. Now, for a lot of us, this is what will fuel whether we will be willing to suffer or not. So let me read you some of these things. Here's a few signs that the fear of rejection is controlling your life. Now, you may hear yourself in some of these, one of these, all of these. I'm not sure, but just listen, okay? You struggle to share your opinion for the fear of being judged and rejected. You fear standing out and being different, so you try to blend in. You lack assertiveness and can't seem to say no. You're a people pleaser. You gain your self-worth from being socially likable. You're extremely self-conscious and aware of what people think of you. You don't feel equal with others. You have a weak sense of self and personal identity. You want to be like someone else rather than just being yourself. You say and do things to be accepted even if you disagree with them. You struggle to open up to others for fear of being judged. You keep a lot to yourself and feel socially isolated. You have a low self-esteem, and you frequently struggle with self-loathing and critical thoughts. See, this literally sounds like the description of society today, doesn't it? I mean, because we're not really true and real and honest about the things we put out on social media. I mean, some people are. People find it funny. They find it ironic. But, you know, a person may be being really honest about their life and how crappy it is, and everybody else just laughs at it, right? But for most of us, that's not what we put out there. Most of us, we put the best of everything that we do, who we are, and what we say goes out onto that platform. Why? Because we fear the rejection of other people, and we are not going to put things forward that would make us stand in contrast to the rest of society. Well, now this kind of trickles down into our everyday lives. And when Jesus said, I have now rescued you and set you free... I have given you a brand new life. I've killed that old one. Here's how you live now. We are now faced with the question, are you going to embrace that in the circles that will reject you? This is really tough for us, church. Because it causes you to shift everything about the way that you think and the things that you do. 
It causes you to look at the world differently. Jesus opens your eyes and shows you something completely different on the way that a life is supposed to be lived. And the thing that I love about being around new Christians is you can't tell them otherwise. They won't even believe you, right? They're like, no, 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 I can't do that anymore. That's not who I am. This is who I am. I'm going to do this because Jesus said so, and I'm passionate, and I love him. And then we just tend to see that passion start to fade away is what it seems like happens. And if we would go back to that list, we can start to pick things off of that list because we're so fearful of being rejected. This is what suffering in America is going to look like, church. This kind of mental and emotional suffering. Because then on the flip side of that, you have the people who are going to be brash and arrogant for the gospel, and it seems like they don't fear anything, but they're just a bunch of jerks. That's not the other way to go either, by the way. Because as we kind of look through this scripture, we understand what it is saying to us. What we have to understand is the way that Jesus did this is our marker and our guide. And then he gave us the rest of the gospels, one of which we're reading, to show us how to walk through this. So now what I want you to do is is fast forward to tomorrow, whatever your life looks like tomorrow. And I want to ask you to think about these responses in light of tomorrow the daily lives that you carry, the things that you see fit to spend your time around and the dollars that you will support those things with. This is where I want you to start to pull all of this together in context, okay? Now, for us, rejection is one of the things that is going to fuel everything we do. But let's go to 15 and see what this says about this, okay? Here's what it says, verse 15. He says, to pick up in the middle, do not fear what they fear or be intimidated, but in your hearts, regard Christ the Lord as holy. Now, before we move on to read the rest of this, this is going to be the key on whether you get this or not, church. Because the reason we can't talk a brand new Christian out of anything is because of that statement right there. They regard Christ the Lord as holy, which means they are supremely serving him over anything else in their life. Because he is now the top, he is Lord of their life, and listen, here is the mark of a true disciple. You ready for this? Obedience to his word. It's the mark of a true disciple. I was just at a conference this week, and they were kind of laying out this whole discipleship thing and this idea of what it looked like and how we were working through this, and here's what it said real simply. You can call yourself a disciple of Jesus all you want. But unless you obey him, you're not a disciple of his. This wants you to like feel that for a second. Because I sat with that and I was like, oh man, that's kind of heavy. <laughs> but I want you to process through that like I did. And I want you to listen to those words again where it says, you can call yourself a disciple of Jesus all you want. But unless you obey him, you're not his disciple. See, this is where this derails for us. Every single follower of Jesus in this room has had that regarded at one time in their life. And it happened right after their surrender. It happened right after they became a brand new creation. God was the most holy thing in their life and everything they did and said went to support that. And then I I honestly, I don't know what happens. I've done this for a really long time and I've seen lots of people derail off of this. I really don't know what happens because it's different in every person's life. But what I do know is the enemy finds out what's going to distract you and that's where he goes to work. Because distraction is the biggest enemy of this right here. Because we talked about last week, like a lot of things that are distracting you from regarding Christ as holy in your life are probably really good things. They're just things you give far more attention to than you do this. This is where the enemy works because he doesn't make you feel like you're an evil person doing all these evil things. And so he distracts you with really good things in your life. But then you start to regard those other things as holy. And Jesus just starts to move down the list. The thing that I want you guys to understand, if there's any way that you are going to live a life where you can withstand and endure suffering, this has to be at the top of it that in your hearts you regard Christ as holy. He is the supreme top of your life. Then he goes on to say, ready at any time to give a defense 
to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. This is saying somebody's going to see something different about you. Now listen, I'm just going to throw this out there, but if you've never been asked in your life why you live differently than another person, I just want you to capture this right now and go, "Uh uh-oh, something is probably off in my life. Because what this is saying is the way that you live your life in front of other people should invoke questions. Why didn't you react the way I would have reacted? That guy just totally sold you down the river in front of the boss. Why didn't you say anything? That lady totally just gossiped about you and you heard it and you didn't even defend yourself. Why? Why do you live your life like this? So weird. Because then it says we are to be ready at any time to give a defense. Now, let me make something very clear. This does not mean you have to go to seminary to give a defense. Y'all with me? Because some of you are so nervous about what you're going to say if somebody asks you the question, why do you follow Jesus? This would be like you asking me why I married my wife. If I say to you, I don't know, that is not a good sign whatsoever. You should be able to tell me why you surrendered your life to Jesus as well as you should anybody else. Because there was a moment when you met Jesus and you realized he truly is the Savior and that you didn't want to live this life on your own any longer, and you surrendered your life to that, you should be able to tell somebody why. That's all it's saying. All of you can retell your own story. It's your story. So when you're ready to give a defense, remember what it's about. At any time, ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. This is what followers of Jesus are to produce. Not an obnoxious, I'm better than you. Look at me, I'm a Christian. I tell you all about it. I don't really act that way. There is supposed to be something that is being protruded from us that gives other people hope. The man, I don't know if I believe in your God or not, but what you have inside of you, I want. That peace, it seems like nothing ever shakes or agitates you seems like every time something comes into your life, man, you know what to do. If you don't, you have people that you go ask and talk to. I, what do I do? What, what is that? How do I get that? This is what your life living in front of people should produce, church. I, I just want you to start thinking this through, okay? Because as we disciple from this stage, as we disciple in our groups, and as we walk along next to you, these are the types of questions you have to wrestle with. These are the types of questions that you have to sit under the weight of the word and go, wait, but that's not me though, but I'm a Christian. Okay, then we have some work to do, right? If if you don't even know what you would say to somebody, if they ask you, why did you follow Jesus? There's the first place you start, right? How are you going to formulate what that looks like to a person? Okay? We can help you walk through that, by the way. We literally just taught six weeks over that with a group of people that are prepared and ready to be sent out into this world and are actually doing that right now. We can help you walk through this. But the second thing is, the look on your face, the actions and reactions out of your life should show people that there is hope in this world. They may not know what the heck it is, but they know that they want it, right? So, now let's look at verse 16, 17. Verse 16 says, yet do this with gentleness and respect. I I don't dislike apologetics. I think it's good to be able to defend your faith against other religions and things like that. But apologetics always leads to arguments. And apologetics seems to always lead to a place where one of you is going to win and one of you is going to lose. And if you're conquering somebody for the gospel, you are not showing them the love of Christ. If you've been able to shut them down because of your intellect on how to defend scripture and show them they're wrong, that is not going to draw them to Jesus. So I think you should know it. It is not what you should build your life around. This is the key to all of this with gentleness and respect. 
If another person doesn't believe what you believe, why would that offend you? You were that person before too. Before Jesus, you didn't believe it either. So what is it that we get so offended by when other people don't agree with what we agree with? That is so ridiculous. And this is the reason why people don't want to know about Jesus, because they're afraid of getting into a fight. And when we look down on all these other religions and we call people names of these other religions and we completely just tear them down, and that is not our place. We have no stance to stand there and do that because that is not gentleness and respect. We saw this modeled by Jesus. We saw this modeled by Paul. We saw this modeled by all of the New Testament writers where Paul could have walked in to this city called Mars Hill where they literally had more gods, lowercase g, than people in the town and could have said, you guys are a bunch of fools. Why would you take this water bottle and make it a god? But literally, if you took a drink of this and it quenched your thirst, you could say, I now want to offer this up to be a god, and I'm going to serve this water bottle. And they said, okay, put it in the mix here. But Paul walked up and said, man, you guys are religious people. I like that. I've even seen that you've left this spot for this unknown god because you've left something open for discussion. Let me tell you about the God I serve. He didn't tear anybody down. He didn't destroy anybody. He didn't win an argument by showing them how wrong they were. He had gentleness and he respected what they believed. Why? Because we have to keep a clear conscience about this. Let me just play a scenario out for you. You go to a coworker tomorrow morning and they say, hey man, I, I know something's different. I know you went to church yesterday. Why don't you tell me about Jesus? And you start to tell them about Jesus and they start to press you and you start to get angry and then you guys are arguing and fighting and now you either have to do one of two things. You have to hope they forget about that and just come in tomorrow with a box of donuts for them or something or you have to go back and apologize. Say, hey man, that was not how I should have re reacted and responded to you. But that does not leave you with a clear conscience, does it? They're not attacking you. They're attacking the Jesus that you serve. Your words and your actions and your goal is to show them that there is hope with gentleness and respect. So I can keep a clear conscience so that when I am accused, those who disparage my good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. So six months from now, the same office worker who tried to press you and you responded gently and respectfully starts to talk about you in the office. Can you believe Mike, man? I mean, that dude, he is so full of himself and he is this and he is this. You know what the other people are going to say? Hey, listen, I, I don't necessarily believe in what he believes in, but that is not true about him. That dude came and he helped me move. That guy came and he sat with me when my mom was sick. That girl, she came over and she helped me in one of the darkest times. I don't necessarily believe what she believes in, but that is not true about them. Don't say that. That is what you would want your coworkers who don't even believe in your Jesus to say about you. But that is only going to happen if you do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, church. And if we come back to this first example where we would take this person who knew nothing about Christianity and, and turn them loose in America and say, tell us what you see. And I unfortunately don't think they would come back with this good report. And go, man, Christians are so gentle and respectful. Like it doesn't matter what I believed. And I came and I had conversations with them and they just showed me this hope and they, were, they weren't rude or brash and they didn't try to defend anything. It's amazing. But that is what should be said about those of us who follow Jesus. Look at verse 17. It is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. So we go back into the office. Let's say that that conversation didn't go well. You and this person are now fighting, and this fight just continues and carries on. Well, now you're going to suffer for a different reason. Because now all of the office is going to joke and laugh about you because you claim this loving God, but you're not loving at all. And so now you're going to suffer for a different reason. He's saying it's better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. Now, 
Let me pick up on that phrase in the middle. If that should be God's will. Here's what some of your life is going to look like. You ready? Some of you are going to get saved, be very successful business people, live in a really nice place, and honestly have anything that you want. And God will bless you with that. Some of you are going to be saved and things are going to be taken away from you. And you're not going to understand why. And it may be health and it may be finances. It may be both. And some of you are going to land somewhere in between that. Okay? Now, suffering is meant to drive you towards God. Suffering is his way of maturing you from one phase to the next. How can we grow if we stay the same all the time? Right? If I go to the gym seven days a week and lift the same amount of weight for the same amount of reps and do the exact same workout every single day, I will literally not change ever. But in order to change and grow, habits need to change, habits need to grow, weight needs to go up, things need to change, and it's the same way in your Christian life. And if you are going to move from this baby Christian into a mature Christian, the only thing you're going to see what comes out when it's produced is suffering. And as you start to feel the weight of the world around you, you're going to see what comes out because the Bible says what comes out of that mouth comes out of that heart. So let's talk through the scenarios. For those of you that God will go, you know what? I'm going to bless you and I'm going to give you everything that you want. You're going to have a nice bank account. You have a nice house and you're going to be very successful. Well, here's where you're going to get caught. Because God says, hey, I've given you a nice citizenship here in a place that your primary citizenship does not reside. What are you going to do with this? You're going to buy and build a bigger kingdom for yourself? You're going to build more assets for yourself here? Or are you going to take what I gave you and be the most generous person around? Because I've blessed you with this. Because then you can look across over here and you can see the person that God said, you know what? I'm not going to give you those things. But what you're going to struggle with is constantly being negative and wondering why and cursing me and asking me why things are always going to be like this, God. And both people are going to have to struggle through things. And the people in the middle here are going to have a balancing act of both. Because this is what American suffering is going to look like. And the thing that you have to understand and and decide is where are you on this scale, right? And then you have to sit and you have to go, okay, if, if God were to come down and hang out with me for a day, would he be pleased with what I'm doing with what he gave me? Or would he look and go, man, you sure do like yourself a lot. You got some nice stuff for you. I didn't know anyone needed 12 iPads. That's crazy. <laughs> I mean, but it's weird like when we're not in the presence of God, but if we knew he was showing up to the house, things would be a little bit differently, wouldn't they? It's better for us to suffer for doing good. This is going to happen to you. But the way most of us react to suffering is we're confused, we're angry, we don't know why it happened, and we typically don't learn anything through it. Instead of going, okay, I'm not like Jack to suffer, but I know that God is taking me from one level of maturity to the next. What do I do with this, God? What do you, what do you want to show me, Okay. What am I holding on too tightly? What do I need to release? Let me grow through this. Let me ask you a question. Would you rather go through suffering and get nothing out of it and then have to just keep repeating this process? Or would you rather see this, experience it, grow, and move on to the next one? I mean, of course we would want to learn from this. Of course we would want to become more mature in our faith and our walk. Why would we do this for nothing? So, I'm going to end with one of my favorite verses in Scripture. It's John 16. This is Jesus. He's talking to his disciples, and he's nearing the end of his life. And I just want to read you one of the, or a few of these verses. We're going to end in 33. This is Jesus kind of setting the tone for everything we've been talking about. He said, Jesus responded to them, do you now believe? Indeed, an hour is coming and has come when each of you will be scattered to his own home and you will leave me alone. He is saying, you guys are all going to desert me, okay? 
Now, Peter's already said, I'll go to jail for you. I'll die for you. And he was the very first one to run away from all of that. He said, all of you are going to leave me, yet I'm not alone because the Father is with me. This is your hope in suffering. You are not alone. The Father is with you. I mean, come on, church. Amen. Because for us, this is our fear of rejection. I can't be alone. I can't be single the rest of my life. I'm alone. Well, not if you're a follower of Jesus, you're not. I can't, I can't be the only person in the office that just sits in the cubicle by himself and nobody talks to. Why not? You're not alone. I can't be around all my coworkers and be the only one who loves this. I'm going to be so lonely. No, you're not. If you understand what Jesus is saying here, he says, you're all going to leave me, but I'm not alone. Me and the Father are together. Look at the next verse. 33, it says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. Isn't that amazing? We should all go get tattoos of this this afternoon, okay? Because this is incredible. He says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Here's what this word peace means. It's incredible. Peace means security and safety, but it also means the tranquil state of a soul that is assured through its salvation through Christ. That's literally what this word means. Isn't that incredible? So for us, this means we should fear nothing on this earthly life. Because this is God's refining process of us. The thing that I want you to understand about this word suffering, it literally means pressing in or pressure. And as I started to read and unfold of what he would have been talking about in this context, it all came back to this whole idea of pressing grapes. And there's two ways to press grapes. There's literally where it smashes, and then there's one that is a slow pulling out of the juice. So here's what it looks like. The most expensive wine is ones that where you take the whole entire grape cluster and you put them down in this bin and there's a rotating uh, screw that will pull all of them down. And what it does, it just breaks the skin so that the juice can just slowly drip out. And it pulls the stems off of everything and it discards them. And what comes out in the bottom is the pure juice of that grape. That is a much longer process, and it just drains slowly, okay? Now, whenever that process is completed, which takes a while, for some of you, this is what suffering is going to look like. There's going to be this, just this process of a really long draining of everything that you have. And then you have to go back to that verse and go, but remember, though, I'm not alone. Me and God are together. God is with me. But then there's another process to this. About 10% of the grapes are going to be left. And then they're put into this giant cylinder. And there's a big block placed over it that has a hand crank on top of it. Now they use a machine. But constantly and continually, they just slowly turn this wheel. So it just continues to slowly crush and crush and crush under the weight of what's being turned over top of them. And that literally obliterates the grapes completely, and then you discard all the other stuff. And this is when he is saying there's going to be suffering in this world. This is exactly what he's talking about. Translated back, that is the straight and narrow path. Now, if you remember what Jesus said about that, he said, wide is the road that many people will be on because it's really easy and there's no suffering there. But really narrow is the road of those who are going to follow me. And all of that comes back to this word, suffering. Because he says there will be suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. Here's what that word means. It means to overcome, to conquer, and to carry off the victory. Like I just pictured Jesus taking this victory, throwing it up on his shoulder, and walking off the battlefield. <laughs> Because that's him and he's epic, okay? But then, the interesting thing about this root word, it's the root, root word of Nikkei. 
which translates to victory, which translates to a multi-million dollar corporation called Nike. It's literally where they got this. Now, they're going to tell you they got it from some goddess. They got it from Jesus, so they need to pay respect, okay? But that's where it comes from. That's what the word means, victory. Here's where we're going to end. There's going to be suffering. The quicker that you embrace that, the quicker you can start to now move through the process of discipleship and maturity that Jesus intended for you to be. But... Take heart, be courageous. He's conquered this world. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and pray. God, I know that this is never a enjoyable topic to hear. It's never a fun topic to kind of work through as Christians. But God, your word is very, very clear that if we're followers of you, we are going to suffer. So there's ways to do it. I pray right now, God, that we would all be taking inventory of our life. That we'd be very clear about some of the the context that we're going to be entered in tomorrow in our our normal daily routines. And that we'd be able to sit with this scripture and we'd be able to walk through it. We'd be able to understand that as we are walking out and we're literally living observations of who you say we should be, God, that we are discipling people all of us, constantly and continually, the question is, who are we discipling them to? And so, God, I pray right now that we would take this inventory of our life. We'd be honest about this. And, God, we'd respond accordingly. So for the people in this room that would go, man, thank you, Lord. I am actually living this out the way that I should. God, we praise you for their diligence and their surrender and their pursuit of you. What we would ask, God, is that you would spur them on to grab somebody and take them along with them. Somebody who's struggling, who can't figure this out, who cannot just get ahead on their own. God, let them take them and walk with them in discipleship. For the people who are, you're kind of on the fence. It seems like you're hot, then you're cold, and you're hot, then you're cold. Let me just say to you that I know that you want to regard God as the most holy thing in your life. So just pursue that today. Surrender all of it. It, It's In this citizenship here on on earth, it's not worth anything. Surrender all of that garbage. It it can bring you some temporary happiness, but it's going to bring you eternal misery if that's all you live for. Of course, you'll have the joy of your salvation in Jesus, but right before you enter, you're going to wish you could come back and redo things. Don't live like that. Confess that. Surrender it. More importantly, repent of that. Walk away from it. Embrace the life God has for you. And then for those of you that are not followers of Jesus in this room, what I hope that you heard today is that he truly is the hope this world has left. And he truly is the the place that you yourself, whether you agree or believe in him or not, can truly find hope. And we've created a space for you to ask those questions. Because right back there on those couches, there's going to be people ready to talk with you back there. So as soon as I'm done praying, just get up and head back to the back and let's have a conversation. God, we love you and I pray right now for my brothers and sisters in you. Let them leave this place embracing what you said our Christian life would be. Let us not waste the suffering that comes into our life. God, let us, just like John 16, 33, take heart and be courageous because you have overcome this world. And God, if there's anybody in here that's not a follower, let them surrender their life to you today. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.